Thank you. Our next speaker is going to actually be two speakers. Uh, it's going to be Dr. Jackson Cochran, who was one of our inductees last night, and Malcolm Williamson. And they both work at the University of Arkansas Center for Advanced Spatial Technologies for CAS. Uh, Jackson is the director of, also the director of the Advanced Research Computing Collaborative. And over the past 17 years, like we said last night, Jackson has been named the principal or co-principal investigator in projects, representing over $20 million in awards. He also serves as the director for the Central Region Board of Directors and the National Board of Directors for the American Society. I'm going to mess up this word. It's not a cybersecurity word. I don't know it. And remote sensing. Malcolm Williamson, who's joining in, is currently serves as a geospatial applications and education manager at CAS, overseeing a wide diversity of programs ranging from K-12 outreach to a broad spectrum of spatial analysis projects to architectural and archaeological 3D visualization. Welcome, Jackson and Malcolm. Thank you, Ken. So I'll wait for Matt to pull up the slides. And we'll try something different here. We're going to try to let us take control of the slides and we'll see how that works, Matt. Okay, well, I think I have control of this now, Matt. Can we... Okay, well, thank you, everyone. We, um, um, we want to talk a little bit about mobility data and, uh, and, and, and its use in response to COVID, uh, to the COVID-19 crisis. So we'll, we'll first sort of delve in a little bit to mobility data and what it is, and then talk about how it's been used. Uh, but first, we want to define a little bit about, define what mobility data is. And so I feel like mobility data, which describes the movement of people uh, throughout space and time, is really just a euphemism in the technology world for tracking your cell phone data <laughs> and keeping track of where it is at any given time. And this certainly has a great deal of economic value, uh, as, we'll, as we'll discuss, and as Brett has pointed out uh, in his uh, talk about the applications that use mobility data to uh, enable what they do. But the data underlying all of that has some privacy issues that we need to be aware of in order to make sure that it's still being used appropriately and is available. And just to sort of set up the study a little bit, in, in December of, of, uh, of 2019, the New York Times uh, published the results of a study they did um, for which they received um, about 50 billion pings, cell phone pings, locations over time, um, surreptitiously from a third party data provider that covered about 25 million people over a period of several months in 12 different cities, including Washington, DC, and New York City, and Los Angeles, and I think Chicago. And what you're seeing here on the screen is, and I can't get this, yeah, that's good. What you're seeing here on the screen is uh, those pings around the White House um, over a period of time here. So, Within, this 50, within these 50 billion data points, there were um, 10,000 smartphones tracked within Central Park. So all they've done here is placed a spatial buffer around Central Park and for one day recorded all of the cell phone pings that they had um, in that area. And you can see that there are a lot of people clustered, and this is back in December, uh, a lot of people clustered around the edge having dinner, probably lunch, from their workplaces. If we isolate ourselves on one of those cell phone pings at a point in time, and so that is one smartphone, and then look at that, the location of the locations of that one cell phone over um, a period of several months, this period of the data that they had, 
you can see that cell phones movement throughout the city over time. And the one aspect of, of spatial data, especially spatial temporal data, is that it is very difficult to anonymize for this particular reason. If you then apply the timestamps to these points and then build a track for that person over that same time period, you essentially get a diary of that person's life over those few months. And if you look at it a little more closely, where they are at night, where they are mostly during the day, where they spend most of their time, it's relatively easy using other data like address data or business listings to determine where that person lives and where they work and how their schedule varies from day to day. And so with reverse lookup, you can find that person's name and it's really not that difficult. The only anonymity that, that, that you really have out of this kind of data is its sheer volume of trying to find what you need out of that. But it can be done. And in fact, the New York Times demonstrated that they were able to identify cheating spouses people whose schedule deviated from their normal route at particular times, and more um, of more concern, able to identify secret service agents, home addresses, and their names in the data because of the DC level data that they had in the president's movements throughout the, the day at, at known events. So um, this data is being collected on us and being sold um, and several, there are several companies that are involved in collecting it. Now, it doesn't come from the telephone companies necessarily. It doesn't come from Apple. It doesn't come from Google. It doesn't come from the um, uh, operating system manufacturers, although they are collecting it and using it for their own purposes. But it largely comes from third party, um, third parties who develop software development kits that specialize in capturing location information and providing it to those apps. So many of the apps like Uber, like Uber, um, uh, like Waiter, like Uber, the, the, the restaurants, all of those things that you're seeing will use a standard set of software to collect data. And as part of the agreement, uh, they provide location data to those companies. And these companies aggregate it to a variety from a variety of sources and, and, and keep that we don't know where the New York Times data came from, but they keep it. Um, but, but it was one of these companies in, in, in all likelihood. So one of the companies, um, let's see, Matt, it's not one of the companies that we're uh, talking about is uh, that will that we know about is Enrix. They're a transportation provide provider. Uh, they, they specialize actually in providing parking locations for vehicles. Um, and are actively involved working with departments of transportation, including the US Department of Transportation and providing data to them. Another company that we're going to look at that provides data uh, is SafeGraph. And this one had, this company has actually been very active since COVID, um, uh, since the COVID pandemic in actively providing free sources of data on movements of people for analysis and will look at this a little more closely. Malcolm will look at it a little more closely as we as we move on through the talk. But let's go back to Enrix for a moment and look at that at that app. So it turns out that Enrix has a an iOS and an Android app that they provide. Um, and uh, let's see, Matt, there it is. I hope I didn't advance too far. So I downloaded it to, to see what um, downloaded to see what it would would look like. So it's a, it's a navigation app like you would find from Google or Apple or many other ways providers. But when you sign up for it, when you download it, they ask you to sign uh, to, to create an account with them. And this is exactly what they tell you in the two acceptance screens. We are going to collect uh, email address, username, password, your location and the search terms that you're using, your device model, your cell provider, um, all of the um, all of those things and uh, by creating an account you can send to our collection and use of your personal data so um, you have to be aware of that and this is this is how they get a lot of the data that they use and then resell to other companies uh, for uh, for work now there's nothing wrong with that and i don't mean to throw cold water on the economic impacts of having this kind of data at all 
However, with um, privacy concerns in Europe in particular now, but growing in the US, um, we have to be very careful about maintaining anonymity, um, even in the face of the spatial temporal data that, we, that we're seeing. And one way to do that is that these companies don't provide raw data to people. They provide summarized data that allows you to do mobility analysis without seeing the individual cell phone information. So another example of that, and we'll use um, um, examples in this case from uh, Terralytics, um, and then we'll talk a little bit about Google and a little bit about uh, SafeGraph data. But let me jump in. Well, let's talk about Google first. Google's in here. So um, we, we saw an app. We saw some views like this. I think Brett shared some, uh, some local uh, listings from companies. And this is exactly what you see. It's very uh, useful for us. I use it all the time and, and rely on it most of the time. If you scroll down just a bit in some of that data, one thing you'll notice in most of the listings, and this is for the Home Depot in Northwest Arkansas, you will see a histogram. Uh, that shows the number of visitors at that location from 6 a.m. until 9 p.m. during their operating hours. It makes sense. Most of the time people go to visit on their lunch hours, and this, this was actually on Thursday, so they'll go on their, on their lunch break there. It would look different on Saturday or Sunday, but on the day that I looked on Thursday, it showed a higher than, av higher than normal number of people there in red, visiting at 8 a.m. on the Home Depot. Now, how do they do that? Well, they're using the mobility data. They're using uh, data collected from Android devices uh, to know and, and putting a buffer around the Home Depot to know, or fence, a geofence around Home Depot to know when those people are there, how long they are there, and maybe even where they come from. Malcolm's gonna show you a little bit more of that in a moment. So that's one way that they're using the mobility data that they're collecting on us. And, that, and it's very useful. But there are, also, there are also some academic applications here as well. And so let me tell you a short story about uh, a study that was published in July of 2020. It's still um, under, it's being, it's in, the, it's in press, it's in, not in print yet, but it's available um, um, online. So this is a group of researchers who uh, wanted to understand how the um, sort of uh, geographically uh, disparate uh, mitigation measures were applied beginning in March in the US. Um, there's been a, most of the studies on mobility and its effect on the spread of COVID are conducted in China and have been conducted in China. And that's not only a different response to the pandemic but it's also an area where there's a lot of location data that's free that's available uh, to researchers um, because of the, the nature of the, of, of the culture there. So in our case, it's not as easily available, but this group of researchers were able to purchase data from a Swiss company called Terralytics. And Terralytics is a mobile aggregator, a mobile data aggregator, and one of the products they sell is a um, uh, an, an interchange matrix between locations that tells um, where um, people are, what location people are moving from, locations that they're moving to during the day over a long period of time. And that can be aggregated, it is aggregated at different levels. The data that they used is aggregated to the county level. So we would be able to tell from looking at that data how many people moved from Washington County to Pulaski County in a given day and how many moved from Pulaski to Washington and how many people moved within Washington County during that day for, um, for the period of time that you're interested in. So this is, this is what they used and they set a baseline and built a mobility um, ratio that described the change in those numbers from the baseline in January, beginning in February, March, and April, which was during the time of the data that they, that they had, which of course includes the initial uh, surge in cases or the initial uh, announce, uh, the announcement that we had cases here, and then the surge that took place. And so they're able to compare movement patterns uh, in spring to the winter. 
And that was a number that they that they had. And they also knew, of course, from the Johns Hopkins dashboard and other dashboards that are out there as well, um, where people were, um, where, where cases were being reported and the change day to day in those. And that was calculated as a COVID growth rate. So they were looking at mobility ratio versus COVID growth rates. And they had two questions they were trying to answer. One, do mobility patterns reflect changes in policy? So when there were shutdown orders issued in the various states, did mobility change? And did mobility change um, differently than when the shutdown orders were, were issued? And secondly, is there a correlation between mobility ratio, changes in movement patterns, and reduced or increased COVID infection rates? So they were able to um, look at 25 counties, only 25 counties across 11 states in the US. And what you see here is a graph showing on the vertical axis, the mobility ratio um, over a period from January 1 to April 20th on the horizontal axis. A value of one indicates no change from the baseline, and this is an average baseline. So the baseline was calculated from January 1 through about January 20. And you'll see that while there are some deviations in general, the baseline remained constant. Um, and there are the states listed in their various colors. Shutdown periods were announced on the vertical line. So for example, California announced shutdown on March 19, which is on the graph as a vertical line there. Um, New Jersey uh, followed and so on. So what you see from the data is, of course, that there are some changes. You'll notice that mobility rates increased um, beyond what they had been in um, early March. That could be due to weather changes, but it could also be due to the fact that the first, case in the first cases in the US were announced around early March. And then after that initial surge, people perhaps going out to shop and, and stocking up on toilet paper, it turns out, and groceries, <laughs> that the mobility ratio dropped dramatically even before the shutdowns in every state, even before shutdown orders were issued. And they continued to drop as shutdown orders were issued and rose only a bit as people became uh, needing to go back out and restock in early April. So there is some strong signal in this mobility data that uh, reflects changes, group changes in behavior uh, that can be um, um, related to policy changes. So that's an important finding. There is value in this kind of data, even aggregated and summarized as it is by Terralytics. The second thing they looked at was whether or not there was any correlation with COVID growth rate. So here's what, what you see here is a correlation coefficient between mobility ratio and growth rate on the vertical axis. So values from zero to one. The higher the correlation, the more likely they change together. Um, if there was a correlation of one, then the, core, then the growth rate matched the uh, mobility ratio change for that time period. The horizontal axis marks the lag. So that uh, they, on, if the lag is zero, they compared mobility ratio and growth ratio on the same day. A lag of one indicates that they looked at the change in growth rate a day after a mobility ratio and so on. And to, to not, it shows that at about, after about 11 days, the growth rate began to have the highest correlation with the mobility change. So if mobility dropped 11 days later, 75% of the growth rate in that county was, could be explained by um, the mobility change. So there was significant correlation with the lag of the, the period of time that we um, uh, maybe would expect. So there is um, there's real value in that. So again, that does show that there is a pattern there. And again, this is um, smoothed um, from all the counties, but every county showed more or less the same results. So it has some value there. All right, so with that, that's sort of the general overview. Malcolm actually went in and, and did some work and. We downloaded some data to look at this for ourselves in Arkansas, and he's going to talk about some of the, what we found and some of the work that we've been doing that will hopefully be published in the next few um, uh, weeks. Malcolm? Hi, great to be here with you all. 
Um, so I'm going to be talking about the mobility data some more, but I'm also going to talk a little bit about how uh, how we generalize uh, these individual case data uh, to larger areas and use this for analysis and the problems involved with that. Um, as we aggregate uh, COVID case data to, to polygonal areas such as counties or states, it protects the, the anonymity of the individuals. It allows us to scale the analysis as cases grow. We're looking at you know, almost 10 million cases in the US and over 100 million tests so far in the US. Um, but we also have to deal with something called the modifiable aerial unit problem, which we'll look at in a second. Uh, I'm going to also show you some uh, some data that we worked with in Arkansas and Tennessee as part of a, an article that's currently under review that we co-authored with folks from UA, UAMS, and Oak Ridge National Lab. And we're also going to look at uh, some things that Uber has uh, just has picked up on that, that gives some good solutions for them. Let's see, this is going to advance here. There we go. Okay, uh, this is a, a map that you've seen probably a hundred times so far this year, simply showing the number of cases per county here in Arkansas. And uh, we're just aggregating the individual active cases, in this case, normalized by population, so we can compare apples to apples. Um, this is on August 17th, and this allows us to spatially and temporally compare data while protecting the privacy of the individuals. However, we also work with different uh, uh, scales of, of area. Um, you all are probably used to seeing this at, at the state and county level, but we also often use census uh, subdivisions, such as a block group, which is an area that typically has between 600 and 3,000 uh, inhabitants, or even a census block, which is basically the smallest area the census uses, which is defined by the intersection of natural and man-made features like roads, streams, and political boundaries. And so these may or may not have actual inhabitants in them, and you do have to worry about privacy at that level. So here we are, just as an example, looking at the population density in Knox County, Tennessee. And on the left side, the density has been aggregated to census block groups, which are the larger units. On the right side, we're looking at population based upon the census blocks, the smaller units. And if you look at the highest density areas, the dark red, it, in the block groups, they're kind of grouped together towards the center of the county, whereas over the individual block level, you can see that there are high density areas distributed, you know, kind of all around the county, which are basically obscured when you look at it at that larger scale on the left. Another example, here's Washington County in Arkansas, and the same situation on the left block groups, on the right blocks, and on the left, we are not seeing those smaller areas that we can see on the right there, the block groups down in uh, uh, Greenland, I believe. And we know what's going on in the southern half of the county where, yes, there are people, where are they? So um, this is what's called the modifiable aerial unit problem. Basically the, the size of your uh, area that you're aggregating to affects how it, um, how it works. This is the counties again. And let's pay attention to Washington County here. Uh, let's try that again. Yeah. It's hanging up on me. There we go. Sorry. So Washington County. And you can see that we are at this point, August 17th, we're relatively low at three to 20 active cases per 10,000 folks. Now let's take a look at the same day with the data aggregated to zip code areas. And so now we can zoom in and look at Fayetteville. It says, there we go. So my zip code 72701 has less than 10 active cases. Whereas up in Springdale, same county, we're at 20 to 39 cases. So it's very clear that the scale of the area that you're binning to, that you're aggregating to, affects how you interpret the results, often in an important way. Uh, Uber, rather than using a you know arbitrarily sized areas, they are creating that they're using what's called H3. It's a hexagonal uh, hierarchical spatial index where they're dividing the world up into hexagons. And this is particularly useful for. Uh, for analyzing dynamic movement. They're interested in where trips begin and end and where their drivers are. 
Uh, you've got equidistant cells that you're, because they're hexagons, you don't have to worry about whether you're looking at the corner of a rectangle. And um, these are indexed for efficient uh, operations and easier and faster analysis than just working with point locations. So this has been a, a big boon for their, uh, you know, worldwide uh, analysis. So now I'm going to flip over to looking at some of this mobility data again. So Jack talked about how Google uses this to show uh, when folks are, are uh, visiting certain stores and points of interest. They've made this data publicly available uh, since the pandemic, uh, aggregated to counties for the entire U.S. And so this is, we can see the change over time here. I've mapped these counties uh, based upon uh, the type of trips. We're looking here at trips to grocery and pharmacies. And down at the bottom, you'll see there's a timeline. I'm going to jump through uh, by a week or so at a time. So here, and by the way, so zero means that you're at the baseline, you know, average mobility at these different locations. Purple means higher, dark red mean, or brown means lower. So here in February 14th, things are just kind of random. Jump up to the 21st. Um, well, we see a little more movement in the north there. But by the time we get to the 28th, as Jack mentioned, this is when people became aware that there was possibly a pandemic coming that was going to affect our country. And so people are going to stores and pharmacy trips and buying toilet paper and groceries in large quantities. And so March 6th, still going on. March 13th, still going on. March 20th, oh, it's starting to go down. And by the time we get to the 27th, we are in lockdown mode and everybody is staying home. We keep on advancing a little bit and we see that in the more rural counties of the state where they had yet to see any cases, people are starting to venture back out to the stores. Now I'm going to and look at uh, the uh, mobility data to parks. And so again, back in February, middle of February 14th, uh, yeah, people are going to parks and probably depends on the weather and where the parks are. And I have to mention that there are less counties that have data for this, uh, for the park trip. So there's not gonna be as much showing up here. So in this case, green means more trips. And so February 28th, we probably had weather turn nice. And then 13th, everybody stayed home. So again, this is after the first case in Arkansas was announced. And the interesting thing is, as we start to move forward again, people in the Northwest are going, hmm, maybe uh, outside is an okay place to go. Different, different behaviors there. And in, it was April 24th, and you see more people going to parks in the state. The second, again, more people, even down in Pulaski County. And by July 3rd, people have realized that being outdoors is probably one of the safer places that you can be. And this, this behavior has continued all the way up into September. So we're gonna look a little deeper at the uh, safe graph data as well. Um, we downloaded uh, uh, three different categories, limited service restaurants, drinking establishments, and full service restaurants in West Arkansas. Uh, and uh, looking at about $200 worth of data for, for 982 records showing the points of interest and the patterns uh, tied to those points of interest. And so some of the things we can look at is how long do people stay at each of these locations and some other things as well. This is the uh, data set that we purchased. And so, as I said, three uh, subcategories of types of, of uh, establishments. And if we zoom in, this is on Martin Luther King and Fayetteville, and you can see what we've got. You know, we've got um, bright green ones, our sp uh, full service restaurants, allegedly. <laughs> uh, we got limited service restaurants, fast food. We've also got some drinking places as well. And so besides having the locations, we've also got information about where the visitors come from. Now, these are aggregated to uh, census block groups, as we looked at before. Um, and this table, once I expanded it to basically normalize it for each one of the locations from 982 records, we go to 40,000 records. So if you think about you know, these data for the entire country, this can be a very, very large data set. And this, by the way, this data is for the month of October only. So uh, this is looking at median dwell time. I've jumped up to uh, Sunset and Springdale and we're looking now at limited service restaurants so the small ones were staying less than 15 minutes. 
and uh, some of them 30 minutes and a couple of them maybe up to 60 minutes if we're dining in. But you can see these are fast food restaurants. Most of people are picking up and, and leaving. Compare those to the full service restaurants. And now we see many more where people are staying 30 or 60 minutes. But if I zoom into downtown Springdale here, I can see that even though I'm downtown, I know these aren't drive throughs I've got several locations that are full service restaurants where people are staying less than 15 minutes. So what we're probably looking at is places that are doing carry out curbside service only. And finally, if we look at our, at our drinking places, alcohol here, um, notice that we've got several where people are hanging out. The median dwell time at a couple of these locations is more than two hours. And by the way, we did have to filter out uh, some, some much higher dwell times at some of these locations because uh, we believe that they're incorrectly identifying uh, employees that are staying there for full shift. Uh, we had places where you know, people were staying over a thousand minutes. So now let's see um, where the visitors to these locations come from and think about you know, what this means in terms of, uh, of epidemiology. So let's uh, choose Slim Pickens here in the middle of the, or in the upper right part of this area. And let's see where those folks came from. Oh my goodness. So Slim Chickens in Fayetteville on Martin Luther King, in the month of October, we've got people coming from as far away as Harrison, Fort Smith area, all over the place. So let's move to a little less populated area. Oh, well, before I go there, this is the uh, this is the pattern table that's been expanded, normalized to show each of the individual uh, census blocks in the far right and the FIPS. And for each of those census blocks, I've got the count. So I can actually figure out how many people are coming from each one of these census block groups. I'm sorry, not blocks, block groups. We also see data that tells us uh, where folks that visit these establishments are also visiting either on the same day or in the same month. And finally, we've got uh, not only the popularity by the hour that Jack was talking about, we've also got popularity by the day. So this is more information that can be uh, pulled out of this. So let's uh, go to a more rural area. So I've jumped over to Huntsville. And if you're familiar, uh, Highway 412 is passes kind of on the outskirts of Huntsville. There's a Taco Bell and McDonald's. Let's choose the McDonald's in Huntsville there. And let's see where people come from that visit that in the month of October. And um. This is really not much better than Fayetteville, is it? We've got folks from all over passing through there and stopping at that location. So let's see what happens if we take more of a local approach. So now I'm going to downtown Huntsville and there's a place called Granny's Kitchen. I think I'll select that and see where the visitors from come from for that. Let's try that again. And one more try. Matt, can you advance that one slide? There we go. Okay, so for that location, that's obviously getting a local clientele. So the month of October, we're looking at folks that are probably working in Huntsville or live nearby. So one more example, we'll go to Bentonville. And I'm gonna pick on a, a full service restaurant called Lucy's Diner. And let's see what this looks like. And oh my goodness, I've got people from three states traveling to this restaurant from south of Fort Smith, Smith from near Springfield and out over in Oklahoma, all coming to this restaurant. So we have a lot of uh, mobility in restaurants in Bentonville. So with that, I'll let Jack wrap up our presentation. Thanks, Malcolm. So in the interest of time, I think I'll just say a couple of things and maybe try to answer Alan's uh, question as I do so. Uh, clearly, there's value in this data, uh, not only for, for economic development and businesses, but for analysis of pandemic-like events. But let me point out a couple of things that I think are important. One, um, it is expensive. Uh, and, the, and the data that we purchased is just licensed to us for one year. And we bought just that little bit of data you saw, $200 for a 20-day period. For ongoing analysis, it is a, clearly a valuable data set for, for people, otherwise they wouldn't be charging quite that much. The other thing that I want to address is that privacy is a major concern about this, over this. 
And uh, several companies are taking steps towards limiting the, the um, uh, and governments as well, but companies are taking the steps to limit the, the, what you get out of this. And let me use one example. In iOS 14, I think it was 14, Apple um, expanded the number of choices for sharing location data to four, from three to four. Originally, they had don't share your data at all, um, say from Weather Channel, you get to choose by, by, uh, by app. Don't share that data at all. Only share the data when the app is active or share the data when the app is running in the background. The fourth option now is to share the data, but to share it uh, obfuscated. So they randomly move your location within a 10 mile radius, or I don't know what the value is, but you can share sort of your approximate location and randomly generated. Now that has an impact in, in for you, but it also has an impact on data like this and how we analyze it. So I'll, that's, that's one way to, um, to think about this. But anyway, very interesting thing. This is going to become more and more ubiquitous. The, the old way of thinking about GIS, where we download data from the government, is still around, but it's going to look completely different when we include this kind of data. Thank you to you and thank um, you. Yeah, this is great.